Welcome to Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane. I'm Karen Barry Schwartz, Director of Communications for the Diocese of Venice in Florida. Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane can be heard here on Relevant Radio on 1410 AM and 106.7 FM in Fort Myers and 1660 AM and 93.3 FM in Naples or anytime at dioceseofvenice.org slash our bishop. Your Excellency Bishop Duane, welcome back to Relevant Radio. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back. This is a special day in the church. It is. Today we celebrate the Annunciation of the Lord. And basically, as everyone knows, the angel Gabriel appears to Mary and announces to her that she's going to have a child. She's a little perplexed at the time of the announcement. But basically, it's saying that the Lord is going to send a sign, and that sign's going to be a child. And he's coming really to do his Father's will. And that's what we celebrate with this Feast of the Annunciation. That's certainly very exciting news in our church. Perhaps we'll begin with a prayer to Mary. Well, let's do that. And I just want to say the Annunciation, you know, the mysteries of the rosary. First joyful mystery is the Annunciation. So in a sense, I think it's fitting that we say, I hail Mary today as we begin. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Praying to our Mother Mary is always a good thing to do. I know I do that a lot. We know that Mary hears our prayers and intercedes for us. Bishop, we're just slightly past the halfway mark in our Lenten journey with Latari Sunday coming up this weekend. What is, what is Latari Sunday, and why do the priests wear rose-colored vestments? Okay, Latari Sunday this year is going to fall on the 27th of March. Why the rose-colored vestments? And you say it right, because a lot of people say they wore pink vestments. Well, okay, <laughs> I suppose it's how you define it. Colors are different for people, but they are officially rose-colored. And basically, what we have here is this idea of Latari, we're to rejoice. Why? We're basically the midpoint in, in our Lenten journey, in the Lenten season. And particularly that sacrificial or penitential regime that we've been called to live during the Lenten season, we get a break a little bit. You know, it doesn't say you get to drop everything because that rose-colored vestment is very close to the purple that's being worn. It's in the same family of colors, I guess you could put it that way. But it signals that this is a joyful time. This to be a time of hope. We're, We're getting closer. Easter's in sight now. It's festive in a way. That's why we lighten up the colors. You know, brighter colors tend to be more festive. We lighten up that deep purple, and it becomes that rose shade. We live the hope. We live the joy. The joy, really, we are to experience in a time of penance, a time of worship. And so that's how we express it in everything we see around us on that day. I love seeing the rose-colored vestments come out. It is a feeling of hope. And we we see it one other time in the liturgical year. We do. That's good. Most people don't remember. It's good you bring it up. We see it in the middle of Advent. We don't think in our present-day liturgical calendar, Advent is particularly penitential. It was back in the early church. Just as we take Lent and get ready for Easter, that Advent season was to prepare for the coming of Christ, the birth of Christ. So it is there. Gaudete Sunday, what are they going to wear on Gaudete Sunday? Rose-colored vestments. You will see some priests, they just think it's a little extravagant to buy that rose vestment to use only twice a year. (laughs) I think we spend money in some ways that are far more foolish. I think some also have trouble with the color. It's the liturgical color that the church gives and to speak for a reason. And I think we have to, through that, teach, give the example. This coming Sunday, Laetari Sunday, it is a time to rejoice both in our worship and in our penance. I love that. Very, very hopeful time. And this Sunday also, in addition to being the fourth Sunday of Lent, is also another special day in our diocese. And today on our program, we are joined by our guest, Carrie Harkey, coordinator of family life here at the Diocese of Venice. Carrie will be talking about this fourth Sunday of Lent and why it in particular is important for families. Thank you for joining us, Carrie, and welcome to Relevant Radio. Thank you, Karen. Your Excellency, I'm delighted to be here to have this important conversation today. Can I do one thing before we move on? How's Lent going for each of you? What's happening? Then we'll get into the, the Sunday okay. event we will have, <laughs> but how's the Lenten season going? Well, 
good and bad for me. I, I decided to try to give more than give up this Lent. And I'm trying to do more reinforcements of my daily prayer with intentions for others. That's going well. And then I also decided I needed to give a lot of things to Goodwill and clean out my closet. That's not going so well. It's taking forever, and it, I find it's very hard to let go of things. Well, sometimes we get attached to even <laughs> a piece of clothing or whatever. Yes. Yeah, it, it's true. It's so true. So good and bad for All me. All right. Yeah. Carrie, how yeah. about you? I have to say Lent's going really well for me this year. You know, my husband and I decided that we'd like to be more intentional about our spiritual lives. And so we had a kind of an honest discussion of what was keeping us from doing that, from spending time in prayer. And we had to admit it was in the end of the day watching mindless TV for hours and hours. Oh, gosh, so, yes. So we made the commitment to turn the TV off at 9 p.m. every night and do spiritual reading instead. So my husband has been focusing on reading the Bible, and I've been focusing on reading the lives of the saints. And I have to say it's been wonderful. Like it, I hope it's a practice we continue because it, it just is our culture so noisy. At the end of the day, having that quiet time and spending time with the Lord has been, has been a great blessing. So I have to say it's going well. Good for you. All right. All right. That's always, that is a good thing to do. Sometimes during the, well, sports season, you know, some, the interview, something comes <laughs> on after nine o'clock and it's a big game. Yeah. So uh, that always challenges us. However, it's good to hear how everyone's doing. Now, Kara, you're going to tell us about an event we're going to have this Sunday also. Yes. This Sunday will be our second annual Safe Haven Sunday. And it is a pursuit to directly address the harmfulness of pornography to marriages, families, the culture, and in a particular way, how it harms our youth and young adults. I think that's really true. There are so many consequences from pornography that I don't think we highlight enough. The word gets said, we'll say topic, whatever you want, and there's an uneasy silence Yes, and everyone kind of moves on. But we really have to look at what are the consequences? Particularly, I think on everyone, but I have a great concern for young people who are starting out their lives, who are forming, they're impressionable, I think that's the word Mm -hmm. to use. I'm not certain that that does a lot to develop how they view themselves as made in the image and likeness of God as sexual beings, but still made in that image and likeness of God. I think it it degrades so many people in so many ways. Mm -hmm. So I think it's Having these critical conversations, we have to equip the family to do that, the parents, the grandparents, whoever it may be. And I think if I understand the program, well, that's what you set out to do. Is that fair? Yes, absolutely correct. Um, This weekend of awareness will provide free resources to our parents and grandparents that will give them the confidence in how to talk to their children and grandchildren about internet dangers as well as look at their own online use and offline choices. So each household that attends Mass will receive a copy of the book Confident, Helping Parents Navigate Online Exposure. And Carrie, what's in the booklet? Well, Confident is a step-by-step conversation guide that includes information about the prevalence of pornography in use today. The first part of the book explains why it is so important to have these discussions about this issue with our children is what raises awareness. It also helps those of us with young people in our lives to think about and prepare well to have those conversations. You know, so many of us parents don't even know where to begin when speaking to our children about this topic. Another particularly neat feature about the resource is that it contains a script with discussion prompts that will help aid parents and grandparents to get those conversations going. That sounds really helpful. Yeah, I think it will be. Yeah, I I know as a parent, this can be an uncomfortable topic to discuss with your children, but it's important because it's happening out there and it's everywhere, isn't it? It is. And you you know, Karen, the latest resource and uh, research and statistics show that, that it isn't a matter of if a child will be exposed, but when. Wow. So the average age that children are exposed to porn is 11. Oh, my gosh. 11 years old. 11 years old. And some um, experts suggest it could even be as young as nine. That's just shocking to think about. It is. That's daunting. Yeah, I I suppose if it's in the home and not, uh, should I say, supervised in some way, their time with the, you know, I want uh, pornography. It's not new, but certainly availability vis-a-vis our our social media generation, whatever you, how you want to term it. I suppose that just opens it up to everyone. 
It does. It does. You know, I remember when this issue came into our own family um, years ago, my husband and I, we were totally unprepared on how to respond. The topic of pornography wasn't even on our radar. We had no clue about its prevalence. Um, Our oldest son, who's now 24, was in the third grade at the time. As parents, we thought we had done everything right. We kept the computer in that living room common area. Our kids didn't have TVs in their bedroom. Um, so, and this was before the smartphones you mentioned, Bishop, were in everybody's pockets, right? right, right. Um, but, you know, the reality is our son went to a friend's house who didn't have the same rules. Mm. And so he had an exposure through the friend's computer that was kept in the bedroom. Luckily, we found out about it and were able to have that discussion with him. But I remember fumbling through it. We were just oh gosh, had I'm no sure. idea what to even say. We would have been so grateful to have had a resource like Confident to aid us in that. So I'm grateful to uh, Bishop Dwayne for making their families a priority and providing this opportunity. Well, I think we have to. I've had a chance to look at the book a little bit. And, you know, you, you introduced the program. I mean, we brought it in a year ago. Right. And we're coming back around to it. So everyone doesn't think, well, that's solved now because <laughs> it's far from solved. But in looking through that book called Confident, I'm pleased I took the time to say, okay, one evening I just grabbed it and thought, let me read this. And it really is good, not just for parents, but for someone like myself who young people come in, they want to talk about this. They don't feel comfortable. They don't basically think it's good for them, but they're doing it. And they know it's not. They want to talk about it. And I think that that consciousness is raised within them. You know, okay, somebody started the right job down the road with them, but we have a lot more to do along the way and can't think, yes. I did enough. Like you mentioned, your own family. Yeah. Suddenly it's in the middle of the, the <laughs> ring and, yeah. well, we got to address this one right now. <laughs> I'm sure there's a little bit, you go first. No, honey, you go. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, yes. between the spouses. <laughs> uh, let yeah. the other one do it. <laughs> this Absolutely. is yours. <laughs> the, I, I looked through the book as well and I there was a quote in there, Carrie, that I loved that said, And remember, God's grace is bigger than your parenting oversights. Your mistakes are opportunities for God to work. And I really like that. I think it gives some practical advice as well as some advice like that, which yes, is good to read. It, and true. And, and it's a good reminder that we certainly are not able to control everything our children are exposed to. Uh, my personal story is certainly a good example of that. Um, but what is great about these tools that are provided on Safe Haven Sunday is it not only provides tips on how to prevent exposure, but it, on what to do when, when there is exposure, and there certainly will be. It seems unavoidable. Yeah. Tell yeah. me, what, did, what is it that I've been reading the book, Covenant Eyes, it's called. Tell me about the, the group behind all this. Yes. Yeah, so Covenant Eyes, they're the one that is printing these books, and they've got tools on guiding parents on how they can take practical, concrete steps to make their computers and smartphones and things like that safe. This effort comes directly from developed in response to the 2015 statement from the United States Catholic of Conference Bishops, Create in Me a Clean Heart, a Pastoral Response to Pornography. So that document states that the use of pornography by anyone in the home deprives the home of its role as a safe haven and has negative effects throughout the family's life and really across generations. I love that it's called Safe Haven Sunday, that whole notion of your home being a safe haven. That's what every parent strives for, right? Exactly. That's that's what you want. And I suppose to create that environment is difficult. The other point that always struck me is In reading about this, it certainly violates the dignity of the human person, the human being. I spoke earlier, made in the image and likeness of God, but the individual themselves. I mean, first of all, what appears before, before you, and then the response that it solicits is not a positive thing overall. So I think we have to look at that. And really, that statement that you speak of from the U.S. bishops, it really encouraged parents to be cautious about media in the home. Absolutely. And, you know, that word media, you know, growing up when I was back a teenager, you know, it was print. That's all it was in the home. Mm -hmm. Okay, television, but television was maybe censored a little bit more, sanctioned a little bit more. That's all gone. Mm -hmm. Most of these children have a phone. On that phone, you can, it's just not for mom and dad to call you. Many times when (laughs) I speak to young people, you know, I'll, I'll refer them to go find maybe a prayer, maybe something, and I'll say, Yeah, but you know, not everything on that device is good. (laughs) 
You know that already in your life. Yeah, yeah. because they yeah. do. And this gives some advice, maybe not too strong to scare anybody, but to say, you know, that's not who God wants us to be. So that whole idea of this issue of pornography and its impact on the family. Carrie, what's being written about that these days? Well, they're seeing that it's, it's you know, like, you, like you mentioned, Bishop, there, it's the formation of the child and how they view the dignity of the human person. It's, it's, it's creating kind of a distorted view of, uh, of the human person, and it's leading to people to view others as an object for their own use versus being a true gift of self. Um, so it's leading to problems in dating, problems in, in marriages, that sort of thing. Well, I just want to thank you and the evangelization department really for making this a priority and getting it out there. And I really encourage everyone who's listening to go online, check out that site about Covenant Eyes. Mm -hmm. And there you can learn a great deal about what the real difficulties without us reading out statistics at you, right. how prevalent this is and what needs to be done. Carrie, where, where can people find more information about the issue of pornography and its impact on the family? Great question. So for more information, people can visit our website, dioceseofvenice.org, and under the Marriage and Family Life tab, they'll find a whole section dedicated to ensuring our homes are safe havens. And through that site, parents and grandparents can access free online courses related to internet safety, as well as informative articles like why parents should keep smartphones out of the bedroom. Along with resources for parents, though, there's also resources for educators, clergy, those who struggle. What's great about this customized page is that users can be certain that everything they find there is in line with Catholic teaching. And then people can also contact me, Carrie Harkey, directly at harkey at dioceseofvenice.org. Great. Thank you for that, Carrie. And Bishop, that was an interesting conversation. You are listening to Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane on Relevant Radio. I'm Karen Barry Schwartz, Director of Communications for the Diocese of Venice in Florida. Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane can be heard anytime at relevantradio.com and on the last Friday of each month on 1410 AM and 106.7 FM in Fort Myers and 1660 AM and 93.3 FM in Naples or anytime at dioceseofvenice.org slash ourbishop. Bishop, there's obviously a lot going on in the world right now. I'd like to talk a bit about the tragic events of the Ukraine. At the beginning of Lent, I know the diocese had a special collection for humanitarian relief for the people of the Ukraine on Ash Wednesday, which was somewhat out of the ordinary to do a collection like that. Yes, it was. But I think the word you use when you describe this, use the word tragic. Mm -hmm. Clearly, we have a human tragedy in the making, ongoing, in our midst, in our world today. Ash Wednesday, every Lenten season for a number of years now, has been devoted to a collection for Eastern Europe. It is a tradition. In looking at that and what was going on in the Ukraine and where the Ukraine is located, I just thought to myself, it has to be about Ukraine. I think everyone could see at that time already the spillover. Primarily it was into Poland. Now we know it's in Hungary, it's in Romania, it's in Moldavia. We have to address this in a bigger way. So we did take up a collection. And we noted that people could send donations that they wanted to, to the diocese, and we would just, over time, make it part of it. I can't help but say how generous the people have been. I mean, it's just been mind-boggling, the generosity of people. We see the same pictures. You know what they're moved by. You hear the same stories where, you know, they were holed up in a theater. Women and children, basically. Mm -hmm. The men are gone. They're out. And the theater was bombed because they knew they were there. Mm -hmm. yeah. The next day, they were going to go out. It's just sad. The funds, I want to talk a little bit about the generosity. Certainly, the expectation has just been totally exceeded. We'll put, send them in through Catholic Relief Services, which is the charitable, the international charitable arm of the Bishops' Conference. In the United States, we have Catholic Charities, but that's for domestic. In the international realm, it's Catholic Relief Services, and they're part of something called Caritas. Throughout the rest of the world, when you have the international section of giving of a bishop's conference, everybody calls it caritas, which means love, charity, mm -hmm. however you want to define it. Catholic Relief Services, the American branch of that, will themselves, they have representation in the Ukraine, but then they work with all the partners in that part of the world. Like they'll be working with Caritas Poland, Caritas in Hungary, Caritas Romania. All the groups will come together. And like other countries, 
Caritas Norway. Okay, they'll be coming in through that whole network. The church has established that. I think it came after the war. It came the last time we saw this great mass exodus of humanity from a country brought about by the atrocities that war can commit. That's what kind of brought about it. Just I was seeing what everyone was seeing, and I thought, I think we have to respond to this. We've done it once before. We did it for Haiti when they had had a hurricane and any number of things all at once. We did that, and that to this day is the largest collection during my time ever taken up. It remains to be seen. This Ukrainian one may pass it by. Yes, and it is shocking. You mentioned the mass exodus. I know just reviewing your letter about the collection on Ash Wednesday, you had said 500,000 people at that point had fled the Ukraine. I think now it's up to 3 million. Yeah, 3 million, and it's moving on up. Yeah. The people from the eastern part of the country have moved west and moved out. But what happens in the western part of the country? Where are they going to go? And, you know, um, I myself lived for a time in Rome when there was a lot of Albanians coming to Italy, when the conflict in Kosovo, in the former Yugoslavia, some of them were coming out. A culture, a society can only be burdened for so long by other than family, if I can put it that way. (laughs) You know, somehow family gets the pass. I think what we've seen Poland doing and others is now passing Ukrainians on and making it impossible to go where they have family. Is it France? Is it Spain? Is it England? Where do they have family? Is it the States? Something that I, uh, the U.S. has talked about already, and it happened in the European countries. They have something called temporary protected status, where someone, when they're kind of forced to move out of their country, are you an immigrant? Are you a refugee? That's always a a fight over which war. And there's very technical definitions. But TPS applies to when somebody's forced out, where they're able to get local benefits, they're able to work, and somehow they can, maybe if they have a language, they'll drop quicker into making a living, being able to support themselves. And as I said, a number of the European countries have done that. And the United States, for the Ukrainians who'll come in, have designated this TPS status. That's so right. it gives yeah. them a chance to provide for the family. You know, parents, if they've come with children, first of all, men between the ages, I think it was 18 and 60, were not allowed to leave. And we all saw, we all heard uh, families coming up to the border and telling, you know, bye. Yes, yes. very, very sad, families. very sad to see. And you know, in in spite of all these tragic events and tragic photographs we see, there have been some beautiful ones, too, of open arms. I know in Berlin, there were some beautiful photographs of the main train station there of people with signs in Ukrainian saying how many people they could take in, and hundreds of people with signs saying how many people they could accept with stick figures drawing two man, woman, two children, three children, how many they could afford to fit in their home. And that, you know, you see this this opening of arms in, in some places that is really heartwarming, you know, in, in spite of, the, of course, the, the tragedy that's happening. You know, there's something that is on a different kind of scale, but was such a pronouncement. The Holy Father, he went to the Russian embassy and asked to see the ambassador. And, you know, ambassadors are in countries to go see the head of, and the Pope is not just the head of Vatican State, but he's the head of the whole church throughout the world. But he went to tell him, please don't. Don't revert to war. These are human beings made in that image and likeness of God. So I think we all have to kind of step up. We all have to kind of look. Holy Father also sent two cardinals, one who works on his charitable side, another who works with the immigrants, that question throughout the world. We just have to continue to look to our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. Some of them might be much closer here in this country sooner than later. but. What is it we can continue to do? I'm bothered by the fact that these young individuals, particularly young women, young boys, can be trafficked in what's going on here. And there's a whole industry, and they make a lot of money on them. Sad but true. And we have to do what we can to prevent that. Bishop, you mentioned some of the extraordinary gestures by the Pope, certainly. And there's another extraordinary gesture by the Pope happening today with the consecration of Yes, the consecration, uh, you know, of Russia and the Ukraine to Our Lady is something that's been talked about. It's just, it comes out of Fatima. There's a long tradition in it, but it will be done today. I plan to be part of when that's going to be done. Time-wise, it's a little different. So it's kind of a, a rolling consecration, if you could say that. It's going to be happening throughout the day. We all need to be aware of that. And you talked about, Carrie, you and your husband. That's something that anyone tuning in and listening could or should do today. 
Just go online and look for the consecratory prayer and they can join right in with that. That's very that's very exciting. And I, I think, you know, speaking of, of all these refugees and everything that's happening in the Ukraine, I, I love this recent statement from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops that talks about refugee status and says this, Christ identifies with those in need, saying, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink, a stranger, and you welcomed me. This means that when people are hungry and knock at our door, we feed them. When they come to our door cold, we clothe them. And when someone who is a stranger comes, we welcome him or her. The church does this everywhere she exists. We do this because this is what Christ calls us to do. No, it's, it, you know, and that's it's that's so, so true. So and, fitting today, um, every around the world, of course, not just in the Ukraine. But You know, there's that, we talked earlier about cleaning out our closets and doing stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, if I can just say, I, and, you know, we're all the same. Oh, I've had, oh, I've had that. Or, uh, oh, yeah, I'll wear those pair of shoes. Maybe you won't. And <laughs> there's somebody who likely could or would, or uh, at least it gives them a chance to have a change of clothes so the ones that they have on can be washed. So I think we need to, each one of us, look at ourselves, call ourselves to task a little bit. What am I doing and how am I doing it? I can tell you from the collection we did, a lot of people determined very precisely how they would do it. And it's so humbling to see that, you know, what they could spend, say on themselves, uh uh-uh, it's going to be on somebody else. That's great. And people can still donate to Ukraine Humanitarian Relief on our website at dioceseofvenice.org. Go to the giving tab and there is a special button there for help for the Ukrainians. Or we also have the address here in the diocese. They can send that in too. But just to let everyone know, keep it up. They're doing a great job. Thank you, Bishop DeWayne and Carrie Harkey for joining us on our program today. I'd like to remind everyone that the diocese this Lenten season is making available additional opportunities for the Sacrament of Reconciliation, which we are all called to do during the Lenten season, throughout the diocese coming up on Friday, April 8th from 4 to 8 p.m. and Saturday, April 9th from 9 a.m. to noon. And a reminder again that Safe Haven Sunday is this Sunday, March 27th. Bishop, do you have anything you'd like to add as we continue this Lenten season? St. Michael the Archangel is the patron saint of Kia, and we see over and over again the tragedy that's taking place. I know it's it's prompted me that each time I see something about it, to stop and ask St. Michael the Archangel, the protector, to protect that city. I think we need to ask St. Michael to protect our young people from the negative effects of pornography. So I'd like just all of us, as we kind of close, to take the time to turn our thoughts to St. Michael and ask him that as he is the defender, that he defend us in the battles that we face also. And that our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world face due to war, due to conflict, due to poverty, due to disrespect for the human dignity of one another. Let's be conscious of that. And throughout the Lenten season, keep that prayer alive to Michael the Archangel, that kind of all the topics we've looked at today, they be defended. I like that. It's a great suggestion. Yes. And perhaps we can close our program today with a prayer for peace. Let's do that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray to Our Lady on this day. Blessed Virgin Mary, you are Queen of Peace. We ask you to help those who are most need of that protection. We ask you to provide you, Our Lady, wisdom for all leaders who have at their hands the possibility to save lives, to make peace. We pray for all who are working toward it, that they not be discouraged, and for all who are in danger from the conflict of losing their life to an absence of peace. Please, Blessed Mary, protect and send aid to those in the Ukraine and to all who are at risk. As always, we do ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the Amen. name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Bishop DeWayne and Carrie Harkey for joining us on our program today. I wish everyone a prayerful and holy second half of the Lenten season. You have been listening to Witnessing Faith with Bishop DeWayne. I'm Karen Barry Schwartz, Director of Communications for the Diocese of Venice in Florida. Witnessing Faith with Bishop DeWayne can be heard here on Relevant Radio on 1410 AM and 106.7 FM in Fort Myers and 1660 AM and 93.3 FM in Naples or anytime at dioceseofvenice.org slash ourbishop. Thank you.